most confusing when the red light is already on. Red lights are already on. I know, I think it's because they're recording. Yeah. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, they're multi yeah when they record next door, they're multitasking. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to the September 18, 2017 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Karen, could you please call the roll? Mr. Dupuri? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? And Ms. Oglis? Here. Thank you. And uh, with the absences, uh, note for the record that uh, Ms. Hendrickson and Mr. Dick Perry will both be voting members this evening. Uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from uh, the last two meetings, <coughs> August 7th, 2017 and August 28th, 2017. So moved. Do we have a second? Can we do them together? We can do them together. We just did. Okay. I was here for one, not the other. Okay. <laughs> not to make it one of those nights. Yeah. Would you prefer we do them separately? No. We have, did you have a for a second? Here? Okay. Well, we have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Rolling right along. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the next item, uh, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed Second Amendment to the Contract Zone Agreement for the Scarborough Day Spa. Robert Geddes and Lucinda Malbon are seeking to modify the existing contract zone, which is Exhibit 2 in the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance. Um, and uh, introducing this one will be Karen Martin from SEDCO. Thank you again, Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. Um, the Scarborough Day Spa um, has had a contract zone since about 1997, and they've been doing the typical uh, hair and, I'm sorry, nail and skin care um, at the spa since 1997. Um, they came to us recently and wanted to add hair care to their spa services. And normally we, we would not necessarily have gone and um, requested that they do a contract uh, zone amendment. But as it turns out, the language in the contract zone that was originally developed back in 1997 was extremely specific. Um, so we felt like we really needed to come back and clean up and, and um, go ahead and add this language um, to the contract zone. So essentially, that's what's happening tonight. We are adding to the contract zone as an allowable activity in the zone that they would be able to do hair care. The, again, the original contract language specifically excluded hair care. Um, again, uh, we don't see from uh, the planning department's perspective nor from economic development perspective uh, there would be that much difference between um, doing skin and nail care and hair and hair care. Um, they are not requesting any uh, changes to the building. They are not um, increasing employment. Um, they are making no alterations um, to the building or any other types of alterations except for the addition of adding hair care as a service. And that is, don't want right. to overcomplicate it. Thank you. Um, I might just, just to add on to that, just um, by a little bit more context, in, in, our, in our current zoning we do have a, a personal services which this type of activity falls under. And as uh, Ms. Martin sort of indicated, personal services would include sort of in a, in a zone that allows for personal services, a commercial zone, um, would allow, you know, if you're doing na nail care, you want to do hair care instead, and you're not changing anything except for the use of that seat, so to speak, 
that really wouldn't require any action by our department at all or this board. Um, and so it's, but for the nature of this contract zone, um, given that you know the use is in the the underlying zone is RF off uh, Beach Ridge Road, um, but as already noted, the contract zone was approved some 20 years or almost 20 years ago at this point. Um, so, sir. Thank you. Uh, this time I will open uh, the public hearing. Just ask if anyone would like to come up and say anything. Just approach the podium, give your, your name and address, and keep your comments to five minutes or less. I will open the public hearing. Anyone? Watch out for the swarm. <laughs> All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Uh, any board comments? <coughs> Seeing a few head shakes, which I am taking to mean that everyone is okay with this, yes. as am I. Yep. And uh, we will send a positive uh, opinion on this. Thank you. Uh, the next item, hopefully that's not too anticlimactic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next item is another public hearing. Uh, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405. The Zoning Ordinance, Section 6, Definitions, Section 9.H, Performance Standards, and Section 18.B, Higus Parkway District. Um, we also have a companion um, uh, piece here that is focused on the mapping, and I'll introduce that separately for public hearing purposes, but I will welcome Karen back up to introduce this one. This one has a few more pieces to it. <laughs> So Commercial Place LLC, who's the owner of the Enterprise Business Park, um, really came to us requesting some assistance um, to allow a storage company, Bluebird Storage, um, to locate within the uh, Enterprise Business Park. As of right now, the um, only place that the town allows storage, self-storage uh, in particular, is in the industrial park. And what both Bluebird and the Enterprise uh, Business Park came to us and said, well, we think your definition of uh, self-service is perhaps a little bit out of date, and the industry has changed somewhat, and we really do feel like um, a more modern approach to self-storage really could be a great fit within the Enterprise Business Park. So uh, the Planning Department and the Economic Development um, said co really decided to take a good look at this and we felt like there were some uh, opportunities to really modernize both the definition um, of self-storage and also to look at where we allow um, such activities to take place and one of the <coughs> crucial parts of the self-storage uh, industry has uh, been that the current or more modern approaches um, really are climate controlled, they are um, humidity controlled, and they tend to have internal access um, rather than having like 25 garage doors and each unit having a separate um, exterior entrance. And so when we looked at these newer definitions and we looked at the some of the industry standards and we looked at what um, this specific company was bringing to the table, in terms of what they looked like and how they're going to construct their building, um, we said, well, perhaps there is some room to update uh, the definition and to have it be considered for the Enterprise Business Park. And we took this approach really to the Long Range Planning Committee, and I think there was general assessment that, yes, there is a possibility um, to do this, and they were not, um, uh, or they were very much in favor of doing this type of work as long as the proposal can meet the underlying uh, design standards that have been set out um, in the district. And at this point, we really were thinking um, we want to isolate this to the highest parkway zone. Um, number one, that's just um, a, a very contained area. Um, and we looked at the specific lot that they were interested in, in um, approaching um, to do the project on. And that lot actually did have uh, 
some the entrance into the parkway um, really on the uh, uh, circular driveway that's there so again we we tried to consider all the different aspects of this and we came back with sort of a multi-pronged strategy for doing um, for allowing uh, this project to move forward um, the first piece is really modernizing the definition we've talked a, a little bit about that what the modernization of the definition is if you do have climate controlled and you have interior access you have limited exterior doors and you're going to um, conform to design standards of the district and um, you would have on-site management and the hours of operation would be limited um, we felt like we could really begin to capture a different level of development a different level of, of uh, storage and so that's very different from some of the storage that we've seen um, you know really back in the 1990s when self storage was very much uh, being built all around so this really did look different um, so we said we'll add the definition we also felt like uh, again we wanted to limit it to the Haigas Parkway we didn't want to open it up to the more retail oriented zones we wanted it to be um, still within a business park type of atmosphere um, and again the emphasis was going to be on the project any proposed project would have to meet the design standards um, so we've got the change in definition we've got some um, additional uh, pieces to um, add to performance standards with regard to the zone or with regard to the, the use um, and the last piece of that was to take a lot that was already uh, contained in the enterprise business park it is the lot that is fronting both on route one and to the interior access road at enterprise business park that one lot of all the lots within the enterprise business park was zone b3 and so to be consistent with allowing this in the highest parkway we really felt like that lot could easily be uh, changed to highest parkway to allow the project to happen and again we felt like this particular location uh, made sense because the access would not be to route one the orientation of the building is interior to the park so again it's a multi-pronged approach here um, but first thing you're being asked to consider is the definition does this make sense second thing is um, we would do some amendments to the um, performance standards and three we would change a lot from b3 to hp i'm going to stop there for a second see if there are any questions well i think we'll probably do any board questions once we've done the the hearing the hearing part so we'll see if, if what we have uh this time i would open the uh, public hearing this would be for the um ordinance amendments that have just been uh, outlined and, and as proposed any takers <laughs> all right I will close that public hearing are there any board questions or comments on what Ms. Martin just described I have one yeah. question and it's just a just a relatively minor one I believe um, under <clears throat> performance standards and I guess it's three um, changing it to say storage facilities shall be located in lots of no less than one acre and no greater than five acres total lot area is there any specific reason you're putting a maximum on the lot uh, size for one of these facilities we did keep the original standard that was that was already in the zoning ordinance and we didn't have a compelling reason to change that um, the lot that bluebird was looking at was um, approximately three acres um, so again it was a decision to stick with the standards that were already in the ordinance um, that applied to storage other than that we does just decided not to touch that does anyone have any historical knowledge as to why that would be limited and if I had a six acre lot and want to put a storage facility on why is that an issue would be my question 
I don't have a six-acre lot. Yeah. I don't have one. <laughs> right, 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 right. In right. general, you see, so see where I'm going with this. I, I'm gonna, I'm I put a cap on it is my, yeah. my question. My guess, and, and Jay, help me out with this if you, if you know differently. My guess is that um, when the original uh, footprint of some of these uh, storage units came in where they were all one story, they were sort of, far, um, you know, industrial looking, and I think they really felt like more than five acres of, you know, continuous metal buildings with people going up and down. I think it was, I think it was one of those um, standards to try to control the, the um, actual size of, and the look of this industrial farm of buildings. But I'm guessing. That's what we're here for, right? <laughs> <laughs> That would have been my assumption as well, and where this was originally written in '97, okay. ten years before I started working with that. So. Right. Other than right. that, I will not belabor this, but I'm fine with right. okay. what I'm seeing here. Otherwise, anyone else? Um, I just have a couple of quick comments. As far as the amendments, the proposed amendments. It looks like, for example, in number 13, the only thing that you're asking for is to remove the term mini warehouse? No, um, the, the difference in the definition would be that it has to be climate controlled and um, it has to have internal access to the storage units. Right. And I, some of the mini storage could meet that definition, but not all. Okay, yeah, I think I miss, I didn't, convey what I was trying to ask. Oh, sorry. Um, there's no power in any, any of these units other than lights, right? I can't speak to that. Only that, that the, I, I suspect that they're, that the units themselves, like the area that they're in, have AC. I don't know that there's power in each unit. Yeah, I'm not so much concerned about the uh, climate control as a, I am mm -hmm. about the uses, actually. Because 13, of course, says no activities other than the rental will be pick up. Basically, there's going to be picking up and depositing stored personal property, which is, which is a fine use. Mm -hmm. um, when, there, when there's power located in these facilities, we sometimes see other problems that mm -hmm. result from unauthorized use okay. of the facility. Okay. Or uncondoned mm -hmm. use of the facility sure so it's just one thing moving forward I would be looking to make sure that there's I mean if we're just storing material mm -hmm. then there should only be lights and there shouldn't be any power in any of these units sure so I just want to want to say that now so later on we don't not right. I, I agree. I think there's been some some uh, you know questions to make sure that the units are are definitely storage and not being actively used for absolutely anything else. I do believe the the existing standards give both the owner and I think there's a reference to um, you know law enforcement that at any point law enforcement um, they would have access to any unit. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I have right now okay. in this, at this stage. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, and kind of with Rick in, in some things that I will be looking at if this mm -hmm. goes forward, and uh, the first question that I have would be, are there any proposed loading docks involved with this? Because while the access to the storage units is through an mm -hmm. internal uh, system of corridors, perhaps, right. um, the material has to get inside Absolutely. in order for that access. Right. Uh, and once loading docks are there, uh, you start to change the complexion of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that along with that becomes a question on basically the size of what's going to be stored in there. We're going to be seeing giant uh, <coughs> spare machinery. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to be seeing couches and small mm -hmm. tables. Uh, what's, the, what's the concept? Right that's going to set up the size of the mm -hmm. internal storage and how one gets, takes material into <coughs> and out of the <coughs> building as a whole. Okay. Two, two um, uh, 
piece of information. Um, one, the existing standards did put a cap on the size of individual units, and I believe that's 500 square feet. Um, so that's in the existing um, ordinances, and we left it in as applicable to this as well. Um, the uh, second aspect is um, I think I think we've been very concerned about what the exterior looks like, and I think the way we've done it is to say, um, you know, there is going to be limited access, and you're going to have to do that in a way that will conform to the look and the feel of um, the Higgins Parkway standards. So I would not anticipate that you would see the um, the limited entrances that they could have, uh, you know, fronting the uh, internal access road. I would imagine it's going to be in the parking lot toward the back. And I think that's why there's, um, there is sort of an example of dropping the building in and you're going to see a lot of landscaping. I think uh, Ms. Ogles pointed out when we were discussing <laughs> that, um, that it is one of the considerations that they do need to um, be highly aware of the landscaping um, needs that a site like this might may have. And I, I would imagine that that's something that you guys will be particularly attentive to with respect to projects coming through you um, in using these new standards um, and applying the High Guest Parkway design standards. And I, and I think that's sort of one of the key elements that was, so I, I think one of the things that hasn't yet been mentioned is this item was actually brought to our long range planning committee. Yep. And part of the discussion about really what's the appropriate zoning, is it B3, HP, B2, sort of looking mm -hmm. at all the various commercial zones, one of the real concerns was around the sort of aesthetics of right. the activity. And I think the, the consideration was that the highest Parkway, the HP district, really does have our sort of the most heightened and it has its own sort of separate section in the uh, design standards. So everything applies and you get some extra <laughs> right. things right. that apply in the highest Parkway. So I think that was where the Long Range Planning Committee ultimately sort of weighed in on it. Um, right. So there probably will be, to your point, at least one or two overhead access doors, but the design standards will sort of control where those are located, like they typically would in a large office building. Yeah, as, I, as I look at this, the, uh, the proposed changes really don't address that issue. Um, so that may be something actually to take a look at now that we're really kind of moving to a new type mm -hmm. of storage facility. Right. Which issue, just so I'm clear, are you talking about that the highest Parkway standards apply? Uh, no, I'm talking about the proposed standards. definition of the mini warehouse yep. in, in the storage facility. Right. It addresses a lot of things, but not, um, not anything to do with access into the facility itself. Right. And I don't know whether that might be considered something sure. uh, to take a look at in the future. Um, or solely involved with the design standards. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if this is going to go through and these folks are going to get involved, we don't want to find ourselves going through six meetings saying, yes, but that's not a good access. And just, you know, I think um, uh, Mr. Chase and I went through uh, a lot of back and forth trying to figure out how, how do we do this, and I think originally we had talked about maybe putting that into the definition, and then we went back and we looked at um, really what those design standards were, and coupled with um, the interior access as a requirement um, and limited exterior access points, you know, we were trying not to, um, uh, I guess, uh, duplicate some of the, the protections that were already in there, but we, 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 we thought very hard about that. Um, Jay, I don't know if you want to um, add to that, but we... We, we actually stripped down some of the definition just to make it clearer um, and kept it to just the things that would be different and wanting the highest Parkway standards to, to cover that. But yes, we're very much concerned about that. I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Susan, do you have anything? Oh. No, I think it's a very good use of the highest Parkway zone to put something like this in the HP as opposed to the B3. Um, I don't have any problems with this. I just would like to point out, however, as a board member that's been around forever, these um, drawings have one thing. What makes this really gorgeous? 
mm. the blue mm. windows. Well, I was going to say the landscaping, but. We're not going but, to have uh, blue windows. <laughs> I know we're not going to have blue windows. But if you okay. imagine taking those blue off those windows, the only thing you've got that is architecturally interesting is a strip of blue down the long wall. So something needs to be done so that I'm going to like it as much when it's finished as I do now. Okay. In, in, in Bluebird's defense, um, they, the drawings that we pulled out were some existing I'm ones no, from no, another. No, I'm not, yeah. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that this right. is a kind of thing that one wants Absolutely. to look at up front. I've been fooled too many times, yeah. excuse me, those of you who've been coming in front of me forever. I've been fooled too often about what it is I'm looking at, and mm -hmm. so I'm very, very sensitive to it. This looks great, but it's because of the color. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, I'm also in favor of this um, for some of the reasons stated, as, as Jay mentioned and Ms. Oglis said. Uh, I think it's a good use of the Haggis Parkway uh, zone and, and give, you know, uh, puts those design standards at our disposal. And I think um, if and when this comes forward as an actual project, we'll certainly have the opportunity to, to really drill down on architecture, landscaping, site access, circulation. I do think that the placement of this um, uh, at sort of the near just within the entrance to the to the park um, is good and and has the potential to, to work well, given that you're not going to have that traffic going deep into the into the office park. Um, but you know we'll we'll look at all those details when when that time comes. Um, so I, I think it's safe to say we're forwarding a. A positive opinion on this, with with a few caveats um, for things to be looking for sure. going forward. And Mr. Chair, just uh, one thing that I just want to I wanted to clarify because we did we set it in the performance standards, mm -hmm. but we did not include um, the language for the industrial park. It is intended that this use is going into the Highgast Parkway um, zone, but because we did create a new definition. We also do need to add it to the industrial, uh, the industrial zone. Um, again, we picked it up one place, but we, we neglected to add it as a, a use to the zone, and that is our intention. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next item, it's listed separately, separately on the agenda. Uh, it's really sort of wrapped up in what we've, we've already been talking about, but technically it is separate, so I'll introduce it separately. Uh, planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough official zoning map to rezone the parcel located in the Enterprise Business Park identified as map U39 lot 4701 as shown on the town assessor's map from the general business district B3 to the Highgast Parkway district HP. I don't believe we have anything more to add. No? Okay. Um, I will open the public hearing on this in case anyone wants to talk about the map specifically. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. All right. Uh, does anyone have any comments or questions specific to the map? All right. So I think we're, we're good with this, and we'll look forward to seeing what happens next. Thank you. Item number seven on the agenda, ENF Limited Liability Company requests an amended site plan review for Land Rover Jaguar 371 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 46A. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, board members will recall seeing this item earlier in the summer as part of their contract zone amendment process. Um, as <coughs> we noted, this is a con this would be now the fourth amendment to the contract zone and that amendment has been approved by the council and so this is sort of the last stop in the approval process or review process I guess I should say um, and this is the formal site plan review by this board um, this is actually a site plan uh, amendment process there was an approval back in 2016 and this uh, proposal is very similar um, but a little bit larger, um, but ostensibly very similar in many ways. Um, you have received staff comments, and at this point, really just a couple of items of clarification. Um, let's see, there's a, a waiver request for limited uh, reduction uh, in the drive aisle width for a small portion, sort of the uh, easterly most portion of the property. There's about three 
parking spaces that require smaller or are seeking a smaller drive aisle. And the applicant provided some rationale for that based on the fact that they're mainly for display vehicles. Um, I think the really the main outstanding question staff had had to do around the existing pylon sign. One of the plan sheets sort of identified that that's to be replaced, probably to be kept up with the overall appearance of the building would be my assumption, but there weren't any details to that and the notation wasn't really uh, consistent throughout the plan set or articulated in the, in the application, so um, I think that's worthy of some discussion. Outside of that, um, staff had no further comments. Thank you. And I will hand it over to the applicant's team. Thank you, uh, Paul Ostrowski from Sebago Technics with Ryan Senator, Ryan Senator Architects. Um, as Jay mentioned, this is kind of the final site plan review uh, for a uh, lease amendment. Uh, it's similar scale scope as uh, the board has seen before, uh, basically seeking a 15,700 square foot expansion. Uh, the contract zone amendment has been approved, as Jay mentioned, and recorded, which is part of the ordinance requirements for uh, the uh, review tonight. Uh, basically, last year the, this project was before the board seeking an expansion. Uh, after that was approved, the branding changed. Uh, they were required to get a slightly larger building, which actually uh, went it, it exceeded the currently uh, current contract zone, which then started this process over again. Um, we have addressed uh, a lot of the staff review comments as well as the. Uh, peer review comments with the outstanding items being the pylon sign and I believe they were still working on their their, their appearance on that and as soon as we can get a signed package we'll get it uh, to the town for review. Uh, we have added three uh, trees, two Zelkovas and a pin oak um, on that southerly side along Route 1 as requested in keeping with the uh, town's uh, tree process uh, and then as Jay mentioned, there's three parking spaces uh, that are on the northerly side of the, the lot that currently have, I think, a 22 to 23 foot width, uh, which is slightly less than the town's required of 25. That space is primarily for uh, vehicle display. Vehicles will be removed by employees, uh, so it will be very kind of limited uh, uh, use of that lot. Um, and as far as the building's concerned, again, uh, the, the material is the same as the uh, what was proposed last year, a metallic cladding, um, I believe gray and champagne coloring. And if there's any additional comments, we'd be happy to answer. Okay. Thank you. Susan, do you have anything on this? Um, are we going to see a sign tonight? Going to see a picture of what your sign is going to be tonight. I do not have one tonight. Okay, so that's going to have to be dealt with by staff, right? <coughs> yeah, however, the board chooses to see, but staff. Okay, I would like to make that. sure that the board gets to see it. I mean, in other words, if you bring it into staff, that's great. Staff will get the first look, but if, unless they know for sure that it's going to be something we like, and I don't know how they're going to know for sure. They might want to bring it back to us. I'm not sure why people don't bring in sign pit. Uh, so, so just as information, the design of the sign will be very similar to what's on site. Basically, we need to update the colors of it to match the new facade. I'd like design, to see it. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm fascinated by this thing that says. A note has been added to the plan noting that the contractor shall conduct daily sweeping of paved surface to limit the amount of dust and material track generated from the site construction. I don't think, I've never seen anything quite like that. I think it's wonderful. Th that actually came about with uh, last year's uh, board review. Uh, there was a request for a construction entrance. However, because they're maintaining the pavement, adding inch and a half stone, 15 inches thick is not really a smart idea, particularly if they're running $60,000 vehicles in and out of there. So the note was added to limit and make the contractor aware that track off will not be allowed within Route 1. It's a heavily traveled area, and we were adding that they need to sweep up after construction every day 
and check Route 1 at least two times a day. Well, thank you. It's unique, and I appreciate it. Uh, we got the parking spaces figured out, and we got the trees figured out. Um, <clears throat> and where are we with the sanitary district? We sent a copy of the plans with a letter. I have not heard any review or comment back from the district, and I will touch base with them. Just for what it's worth, during our interdepartment review meeting, they didn't have any issues. They just need to finalize a permit for the project. But so the um, uh, um, approval would be contingent on getting that, correct? Sure. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Nick? I don't have a whole lot to add. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Rachel? Yeah, I've, I'm, I also had a, a concern about the sign, and I would like to see it. So that's it. Okay. Rick? No, I'm good. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I think you'll get to see the sign whether you want to or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Susan's going to take care of that. <laughs> I have a thing. All right. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to add either. It sounds like the loose ends that are out there are are within the realm of what we'd expect at this point and we've vetted this pretty well and appreciate your responsiveness to everything ranging from landscaping to controlling construction uh, disruption and um, you know, we've got a couple things that we can address I think through conditions of approval did you have something you wanted to add yeah to? just a just a question clarifying question from the board as I sort of prepare a condition on the sign so I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if we were going to see something um, just is that as I'm writing it right now I based on what Susan had said I had talked about final design review and approval by planning department um, but maybe I'm hearing you prefer that to be done by the board so maybe before uh, the chair begins is speed. there a is there a way that you can, during the during a um, planning board meeting, show us the sign? They have instead of making them all come back again. Um, really, you know, if the board's going to take up an item, it needs to be. If the board's going to do its consideration, get together and talk about something, it needs to be a public process. Um, okay. so if you if you want to see it, I'd say yes, they're coming back, and it probably. Going to be an attractive sign would probably be pretty quick. I um, think we've done that on occasion, and it's yeah. not. But typically, not ideal, but it's. No, I, I know that we usually leave it to staff. Well, but what I mean is, we 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 have had people come back with just a sign. Yep, yeah. um, I would. I I'm going to stick Chimney to my resolve that on with. that. I would really like them to come um, back. If they have to come back, that's too bad. But I would like to see the sign. Thank they you. still leave here tonight. We if we approve it, they still leave here with their conditional approval. Conditional approval. Okay. Yep. So. Okay. Yes. You know what? I actually do have, sorry. I know you don't have to just go back, but I do have just one question. Is the sign the same, going to be in the same physical location and the same physical size as it is currently? Yeah, it's it's not changing its location. Right. I'm not, I, I just was curious. I still, whatever you guys. Um, we we certainly can come back, but I think, and I probably should have included it in this presentation. I think last year when we presented it, we included the sign. Um, it may be in the record already, but. I didn't update the presentation to show that. Find it. I could uh, buy Jay a minute here of time. <laughs> um, just, uh, I know I'm, I'm most likely the minority on this, but I believe this also occurred during the Mercedes discussion, mm -hmm. and where I felt we had an international company with a brand that's already stapled across you know why go through that extra motion we have we know what the Land Rover sign is going to look like this location is not changing and the size is not changing I'm not sure what I need to see that those are my two cents well, you said color is changing so I don't know what that means so, so basically from what it is now I think it's more of a tan I can see, yeah, I can see the sign. It's like got a green Land Rover, and it's got a cat. Losing some definition, but you have to understand. Once burned, twice careful. So what's that? That's the existing sign. So you can just for a reference of of color.
So this side, this image that we have up right now is the would be the proposed new. I brought up sign. What I brought up was what was approved in 2016. So um, it sounds like the architect is saying that that's still the current sign design. Yes. So, so it's the same sign, same location, just a different color scheme. Yeah, that would be that color. Yeah. But this is the color that was okayed in 2016. Correct. Didn't understand that. Yeah, no, this this is this is the plans that were part of the 2016 okay. approval record. Okay, then I don't have any problems. I didn't understand that part. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm glad we uh, stuck with it. Yeah. I'm glad we <laughs> Me too. After that. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. The archive. Yes. <laughs> Thank God for computers. Okay. So that this actually gets built. <laughs> All right. On that note. I move to approve the amended site plan application of ENF Limited Liability Company for the building addition at the Jaguar Land Rover Automobile Dealership located at 371 U.S. Route 1 as, a pro as proposed in materials submitted by Sebago Technics, plan set dated August 8, 2017. The proposed expansion has received approval by the Town Council for the necessary contract zone amendments permitting the proposed site modifications and Based on the board's review, the applicant has met the review criteria of the site plan review ordinance. The plans are hereby approved with the following waiver and conditions. The waiver. The planning board grants waiver of the drive aisle width in a limited area of the parking field as the applicant has noted the area will only be utilized for display vehicles and not customer parking. Condition number one. A pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor. Pre-construction meeting is to be coordinated through the planning department. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, approval from the sanitary district is required. Number three, outdoor display of vehicles shall be located only in the delineated spaces as shown on the approved site plan. <clears throat> Number four, the plan set is to be revised for to further identify the limits of disturbance and the location of the areas of loam and seed. Plans to be reviewed and approved by staff. And number five, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the sign design is to be reviewed and approved by the planning department. That is the motion. Second. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Item number eight, 108 Muzzy LLC requests site plan review for Southern Maine Remodeling, Inc., 108 Muzzy Road, Assessor's Map, R55, Lot 3A. Can you introduce this one, Jay? Sure, absolutely. Uh, this is another item the board has seen a few times, and uh, we've staff's been doing some review and having discussions with the applicant's engineer with, as noted, this is for a commercial development in the B2 zone along Muzzy Road. Um, really, as of our last discussion, there were still some outstanding, um, it's a tight site um, uh, with certain constrictions uh, or constraints, I should say. Um, and so the applicant has been responsive to our town engineer and Water and Kearns, our peer reviewers comments uh, by and large, and, and maybe uh, Angela might want to just touch on a couple of the changes. And at this point, um, staff has limited comments remaining, um, really have to do with items that um, we've sort of identified as potential conditions for the board to consider about ensuring that the boundary of the site is surveyed before any work begins, as well as any wetland disturbance areas are uh, surveyed prior to the start of work. Um, and then um, at this point, that's all I have on this item. Like I said, maybe Angela can I want to yeah. give an update, I'm not sure. Thanks, Jay. Angela, did you want to add anything? Um, I, I think I'm all set. As Jay said, they've been working back and forth with us. Um, the board has seen it a few times. We've seen it many times. So um, I think they've responded to the, the larger comments. Great. Then I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dustin Roma, civil engineer with DM Roma Consulting Engineers. Um, as staff has indicated, uh, we've been 
working hard on this uh, relatively tight site uh, to uh, kind of fit in the necessary components of this project to have it be a successful use uh, for Southern Maine remodeling and a, and a home for a long time. Um, some of the things that we have uh, addressed that we discussed last time with the board um, predominantly focus around really just tightening up the site and uh, eliminating impervious areas so that we're really um, taking everything down to the minimum that's going to function appropriately but is not going to create excess area that would be um, uh, difficult to deal with and was really kind of pushing the limits of the property previously. Uh, we've reduced the drive aisle widths down to 22 feet both in the front and along the side access uh, while maintaining separation from the building so we don't have the concern of uh, vehicles hitting the building coming around the corners. Um, in doing so, we've been able to flatten out some of the slopes uh, that transition the pavement areas into the uh, adjacent property lines where, in essence, the property lines more or less uh, follow the existing edge of the wetland conservation line for the parcel in the Scarborough Gallery project. Um, so not only are they property lines that require careful uh, consideration to make sure where there's no encroachments, but they're also sensitive environmental areas. Uh, so that was the uh, issue that was brought up about making sure that we have survey location of the uh, boundaries prior to any site disturbance, uh, just so that we have that level of accuracy to make sure that we are uh, staying with all developed area on the property. So we are certainly agreeable uh, to doing that, and we already have the control uh, on the property, having surveyed the property as part of the design project to be able to effectively do that uh, fairly easily. Um, some of the other items that we looked to address were some changes to the landscaping plans. Um, there was some placements of um, a uh, dogwood that was on the corner of the building that we've basically moved to be more prominent in front of the building and also added uh, two additional specimens of those on either side of the sign to kind of create a um, unified entrance there. Um, we also previously had um, a row of uh, trees along the frontage of the property and there was some concern about uh, making sure that we could block the view of the vehicles in there so we filled in the space in between all the trees uh, with some shrubs and placed those on a berm so that we can uh, provide that continuous um, green space across the front of the property. Uh, we've also uh, relocated the sign uh, based on the proposed size so that it uh, is in conformance with the setback requirements from the right-of-way. We do have kind of a unique situation here where the right-of-way is fairly far back from the traveled edge of the roadway. It's not the same on either side of the lots, but that's, that's this particular property. It's fairly wide here, so the sign does sit quite a ways back from the roadway. Um, so the, um, and in regards to the uh, permit approvals with the Army Corps and the DEP, um, we've provided the information to the staff indicating that all of the review is complete. Um, DEP and Army Corps are both um, very overwhelmed with permits right now, so they have indicated to us that everything has been reviewed and approved and it's simply in the queue waiting for signatures. So we've sent that correspondence that we got from those agencies directly to town staff so that uh, they had that information available. So um, with that, I believe we have addressed the comments. I'm not aware of anything that's outstanding. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions? Starting down at this end, anyone? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I, I have no questions, but I, the comment I have is I appreciate all of the work you folks have gone to uh, in terms of the, the tweaking on that, that property. It is a tight site, and I think you've done a good job. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Susan? Uh, is that present building going to be demolished? Yes. And the signage, is it going to have lighting? Um. I don't believe we were planning on. Yes. There, yeah, it's going to be down lighting. Okay, so that was included. Ground lights. Yeah, it'll be covered by snow. I'm just, I'm just saying, again, right today that'd be fine, but in the winter I'm not sure. I, I just don't want them to decide they're going to lift the lights up without coming back to the to the planning department. That's it. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, I don't think I have anything to add. Uh, I also appreciate the efforts to to address everything and also in your presentation tonight to kind of methodically walk us through the, the outstanding points, which is always helpful at this stage. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything uh, to add or, or ask at this point. So uh, I will move to approve the site plan application of 108 Muzzy Road LLC for the development of a commercial business at 108 Muzzy Road as proposed in materials submitted by DM Roma Consulting Engineers, plan set dated September 1st, 2017. <coughs> Based on the board's review, the applicant has met the review criteria of the site plan review ordinance and the plans are hereby approved with the following conditions. Number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include uh, revised plan noted, noted related to the limit of disturbance according to the direction of staff's memo, adding a note related to the need for off-site snow removal. Revised plans may be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Condition number two, Prior to the start of construction, the property boundary and edge of all wetland disturbances are to be surveyed and marked accordingly. Number three, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor. Pre-construction meeting is to be coordinated through the planning department. And condition number four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide final copies of the revised DE permit to the planning department. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Item number nine, Rosbera Properties LLC requests a final subdivision review for a residential subdivision at 31 Dresser Road, now called Heldenbrand, Heldenbrand Subdivision, Assessor's Map, R31, Lot 18. Jay? Yep, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is another item this board has seen a couple of times and actually re uh, granted preliminary approval to this application back earlier in the summer, July or August, I don't quite recall the month, but uh, here we are now with a final review. Um, really down to some final detailing um, and uh, so you'll receive staff comments as well as comments from Woodard and Kern on this item. Um, there's a couple of main elements that we want to bring your attention to. Um, I think one has to do with um, the, the stream setback um, and really this is sort of a minor minor element on lots one and two, but at least worthy of discussion and being sure the board's comfortable with what's proposed and, the, um, and that that's pretty clear for everyone as to how that will function. Um, but then really the, the main element to talk about is really uh, identifying the limit of disturbance that's allowed on the property, uh, given the uh, stormwater design and DEP permitting, which allows for slightly over three acres of overall impervious and disturbed area on the site, which when you divide that by the by the street and the number of lots really sort of boils down to, you know, about a quarter acre or so of disturbance on each lot. Um, and just want to be sure we're having So um, we really look forward to sort of hearing that the proposed uh, conditions that staff would have prepared. Turn it over to Ms. St. Clair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair. 
I'm with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight to present to you our final subdivision plan for Heldenbrand subdivision. Uh, if you recall the last presentations that we've done, we've referred to this project as the Dresser Road subdivision, but we do have a project name. Heldenbrand is the family name of one of the prior owners. The proposed road name is Ladd Drive. Ladd Heldenbrand was the father of the family, and that's the source of the uh, road name and the project name. So we've reviewed that with uh, the town public safety folks, and from a emergency standpoint, the naming of the road and the subdivision is acceptable. Uh, so that has been finalized, if you will, uh, with regard to that. As Jay mentioned, we were before you folks back in the summer. It was actually July 17th. We received preliminary subdivision approval uh, for the project. And in the interim since then, we've been working with the DEP to obtain a stormwater permit. That was received on August 31st and is included uh, as part of the application materials filed as part of final. Uh, during the process with the DEP, there were some minor revisions that we made to the plan to address some of their comments. That's all highlighted and noted in our package that was filed uh, with you folks for our final uh, submittal. We also addressed the comments that we had received to date uh, at the time we received preliminary approval, both from the staff, the peer review engineer for the town, as well as you folks. Uh, and so that information was included and it has been identified and detailed as part of our final uh, application materials as well. So I won't belabor the issue with re reiterating those. Those are in the packets for you. But I did want to also discuss uh, some of Jay's comments that he had noted in the introduction. We have received the peer review comments uh, from Wooded and Curran as well as the staff uh, peer review comments. And um, as Jay noted, there's a couple of items which are minor, very minor, plan cleanup. Uh, adding more information to the plan to help uh, clarify to prospective home buyers uh, as well as to the contractor during construction. And we'll certainly uh, work with staff and make sure that those are added to the plan as appropriate for that. Uh, one of the items that Jay had mentioned was with regard to clarification on the area within the 75 feet of the uh, stream that's on the site. So that really affects basically lot two and a portion, small portion of lot one. And that's simply an area that any work within 75 feet of a stream, and I want to clarify that that's not a stream setback. That's a jurisdictional limit that the DEP has for any work within 75 feet of a stream would require a Natural Resource Protection Act permit. It's typically a permit by rule for any soil disturbance at that limit. And those limits do fall uh, within the edges of the property line. So it's a a limited risk, if you will, uh, that someone would need that permit, but we have highlighted it on the plan, uh, and we will certainly add clarification to that, to those particular lots, to really highlight that those are the two areas where uh, if someone wanted to do work within 75 feet of the stream, they would be required to have a DEP permit for that. The alternative to that is actually to adjust the lot line so that it falls all in the open space. We did look at that. We've looked at that a few times going through the process. We really felt that that would sort of tighten up the lots uh, a little bit too much in that particular area. We'd like to have a little more flexibility. It would allow the house to be built closer to the road as opposed to trying to push things back further uh, on the lot and having a longer driveway, more disturbance, that type of thing. So. We would like to keep the, the layout as it is, and we do certainly understand highlighting the notation for that, and we would do that. The other item that was mentioned was with regard to uh, the amount of developed area on the site at 3.08 acres. We have done, uh, as part of our stormwater evaluation and our review uh, of the project, we have done a proposed post-development watershed map, which actually includes houses uh, on each lot. And the data that was provided to the DEP and used in the assessment is based on that layout. The footprint of those houses is a typical house, which has been built by the applicant on a number of different lots. They're all pretty much the same house. As you know, in a residential subdivision, people can have the flexibility to build what they like, and that's what makes things nice about that. And so we do anticipate that some may vary. Some may be smaller. Some may be a little bit larger. We'll certainly work with staff to appropriately delineate the areas and the assumptions that we've made, but we do feel confident that we've done a reasonable uh, effort to identify what we expect to have for development on the lot. 
All right. Thank you. Any board comments? Rick? Yeah, I actually have a couple. Is there, there's one of the comments by Woodward and Kern was in regards to the utilities being located in the roadway, or I guess the way it reads is located um, electrical and communication in the roadway shoulder. And they suggest that you move them or get easements on the is there a reason why you you don't want to do that or you can't do that or we have provided for there's a there's a shoulder between the edge of pavement and where the ditch begins and we provided for uh, the um, electrical and the communication lines to be in that shoulder area in conduit the reason for not um, pursuing the recommendation to actually put it on the back side of the ditch would have to be an easement outside of the 50-foot right-of-way and actually those are in with the exception of cross culverts those are the only utilities in this road we don't have water lines we don't have sewer lines we don't have any other utilities in the road so from our standpoint it made more sense to keep it in the shoulder nearer the the edge of pavement if you will rather than pushing it out further, putting it on the back side of the ditch and outside of the right-of-way itself. Okay. Mr. Perry, I think Angela has, I know she's coordinated with our public works director who will ultimately be maintaining this road, so uh, might be worth having Angela yeah, to chime in here. I had a conversation, we went back and forth, um, we, whether this was acceptable. Um, I guess I would note for future subdivisions that come from the board, um, I think that's the direction Public Works wants to go, is have that easement outside of the right-of-way to have those utilities. The difference in this instance, though, is that they had some stormwater facilities, the, um, the BMPs that are actually w would be within that. So I look at it more from a dig safe point of view. When you go out there and knowing where those utilities are, it would end up jogging in and out to get around those, and it's less predictable. Whereas if we know it's on the shoulder, it's consistently along the shoulder. Does that make sense? Rather than if we put it on the outside, it wouldn't necessarily be able to stay at a uniformed 15 feet off the edge of pavement or something like that. Right. And so it would be more of, it would be less predictable for public works who's out there than could potentially hit it. Okay. But I will say in the future, you'll probably see me pushing for that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think CMP likes that either. <laughs> true, but uh, that's all right. Um, as long as they say it's fine. Um, and the other one, and it's not necessarily in regards to this subdivision in particular, it's in a lot of them that, I've, that we've looked at lately. The way the road's configured, I'm sure it meets town standards and everything for um, emergency vehicles and turnaround and snowplow and all that. But if vehicles were parked there, potentially I could see an issue. Is is there? Do we ever require no parking signs towards the end of the road? Where I know in the winter time we don't generally allow parking on the street anyway in Scarborough. But um, that configuration is the, what we see, which is normal. And it's fine. It's just something that. that um, I, don't know, I like it. I like that nice big cul-de-sac circle thing, but that's that's fine. It's just something to think about in the future. Not for this particular, not for this particular project. I I understand that meets the requirements, and it's, but um, it's just I can see it being a challenge at some point for if if cars were parked there. So yeah, that's all I have is just the utilities, and then just to make a general comment, not in particular for this subdivision, but that that turnaround area might be a good idea to put no parking signs within a certain distance. Yeah, we, we do periodically run into quirky little things like that and other things, particularly with these conservation subdivisions where, you know, you're... It's tight. It's tight. Yeah. And you've got to have to sort of be creative with the lots and the, and the streets at times, but it's a valid point. Okay, other than that, it looks fine to me. Uh, Rachel? And just um, one comment that arose because of this prior conversation, and that is it might be possible to put striping along the, uh, a, a 
simply striping at the hammerhead or other places where there's no parking without going to the uh, extent of um, no parking signs, just in terms of guidance. Other than that, I have no questions. Thank you. Next. Yeah. Any questions? Susan. No, I think that we've covered everything in the um, draft motion. Thank you. I would like to just make a comment, though. They get more and more difficult all the time. You know, I'm fond of saying the good stuff's gone. And we just get more and more of these <clears throat> highly demanding pieces of property that are being developed. And um, thank God it's Scarborough. We have a pretty good reputation and we have a lot of help and we got a great engineer and mm -hmm. I trust her explicitly. But not everybody could be able to do it as well as we do, so go for it. Thank you. I don't think I have any questions or concerns per se. Um, I will um, say that based on what I heard or maybe even just as importantly what I did not hear, I'm inferring that the board is, um, that the board members are not inclined to insist that or, or request that the applicant um, eliminate any lot areas from those 75 foot jurisdictional um, <coughs> limits. Uh, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouths. I personally am okay with that provided that um, uh, as Ms. Sinclair described, the applicant's prepared to make clear to the contractor and, and, the, and, and to owners through whatever appropriate documents what those limits are so that those can hopefully be honored going forward. That's always you know, sort of the leap of faith that we make on these things, whatever the, whatever the issue is when, we, when we're talking about something that's going to be passing into private ownership and multiple different owners down the road. Um, again, these conservation subdivisions, um, you know, we have these little challenges. Um, so I personally am okay with that. I don't. Can I ask a quick question? Um, would altering their lot line somehow affect their current plans um, detrimentally? Well, um, as Ms. St. Clair noted there might have impact potentially house home locations on one of the lots, though not entirely clear to me. Um, you know, obviously it make the lot slightly smaller. I think it's a very small area of encroachment within the building envelope. If, as I tried to line it up on the plans, I was trying to figure out exactly where it was, and it seemed pretty small. So I think it would have a pretty small effect to move the lots and even just get the, the 75 foot area out of the building envelope and maybe just into that 15 foot building setback area so that way there wouldn't mm. again limit the likelihood of encroachment of buildings but um, you know, again it's as sort of stated and I think this board has seen it's a fairly I think to to do disturbance within that 75 foot setback area it is a sort of jurisdictional and it's a permit by rule process as I understand it and I don't believe it would require any amendments to um, Again, for assuming they aren't disturbing any more area than the approved three point odd acres, um, we wouldn't require any amendment to the DEP permit that I'm aware of, but I'd look to the applicant to maybe highlight that. That's correct. The, the type of permit that would be required is a Natural Resource Protection Act permit, so it's a separate permit from the stormwater permit. It is a permit by rule, so it's a two week turnaround uh, and happens when you have soil disturbance. So to adjust the lot line to set it as a building setback, the soil disturbance is really what would trigger it. So it's still within that 75 feet. Uh, and as we noted, our preference would be to be able to have it noted on the plan, which it is. There is a note on, I think it's 27 on the subdivision plan. We can certainly add further notations to the specific lot that highlights that. Uh, that identifies that, but at this point, our our request would be to have it as we have it configured currently. And I see that the, uh, <coughs> the applicant is conferring with his consultant. <laughs> How about we compromise? 
and do <coughs> and do um, <coughs> E. Clarify the location so that it's very right. That was sort of the direction I yeah, was you know, going. Yeah, instead that. of removing it, clarify it. And I would leave it up to staff to work with you on just what that means. But we've done this before. Sometimes we actually um, put up a fence. I'm not saying that that works here. But something to do to clarify the area <clears throat> of the property's ownership for the additional permitting is readily identifiable. Mm -hmm. I like that, readily identifiable. Sorry I missed that. Thank you for catching it. Two options. Right. You can always come up with other options. <laughs> I'd like to make the recommendation that we add condition the, sec the second E. <laughs> the second E? The second E because there's two E's. E A and one B. One E two. Hmm? Either or yeah. question. One E. And I do appreciate that it's, I mean, staff's. Staff's been very consistent in always wanting to be as protective as possible of those buffers or limits or whatever you want to call them. And I think we've generally been pretty, pretty vigilant about that. Um, and I, I think that this, I think that this under the circumstances is an appropriate approach, um, short of actually having things pulled out. So. Mm. Um, does anyone else have a have a comment on that particular issue? No. Okay. Um, with that, I don't have anything further. I think this has been pretty well vetted. Did you have something else you wanted to? Uh, yeah, I, I guess okay. one thing I want to do, and it sounds like we may be headed towards a, a motion with some conditions, and we have some prepared conditions. I just want to sort of circle back and, and just be sure that we have a discussion before it's read into the record. Um, so the applicant sort of understands the direction we're headed in terms of conditions. So there, there's any issues, we get to them early. Mm -hmm. um, again, recognizing that we have three and 3.08 acres of disturbance, and you know, um, uh, we really want to be sure that that's if that's the the number, that's perfectly fine and acceptable, and that's what's been designed for. But ensuring that that is ultimately the amount of disturbance that happens on site, um, we're just uh, talking about including some conditions that talk about um, prior to the start of any site work, which would include tree clearing, which is typically sort of the first step we see, um, that the limits of the 3.08 acres um, of disturbance, as well as the 25-foot cemetery setback are clearly marked. That can be flagging. It doesn't need to be fixed at that point, but at least clearly marked. And then uh, further, um, and this really gets to sort of the future, because um, we know the risk bearers do a good job, and they're you know they're uh, very responsible developers. Have done a lot of work in town, but future owners may not know all the restrictions on their lot. They might say, "Well, geez, I have a two-acre lot. Why do I have such a small lawn?" Um, is really ensuring that a couple of different things. When someone comes in for a building permit, that there's a, a lot grading um, plan with each lot, so that we know how much disturbance there's going to be. And actually, the step before that, I should have mentioned, is adding a table to the subdivision plan that really identifies how much disturbance an impervious area is allowed on each lot. Um, it, again, so when someone's buying it, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. hopefully they look at the subdivision plan. You know, these, are, <laughs> these don't always happen. Um, so those are a couple things. And then the other item um, that we flagged here is that uh, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, um, Having some sort of uh, landscape or hardscape feature that sort of delineates that area of disturbance on the lots, and that I don't know if the board wants to sort of lock in what that is right now, or if you want to sort of leave that as a uh, item that can be sort of discussed on a lot by lot basis based on the developer, property owner's sort of interest in uh, what staff reviews, whether that be a split rail fence, a, a hedgerow, whatever it may be. Um, but those are a couple of the conditions that we're talking about and want to make sure that's Question. I like what you, I like 5A a lot, but um, <clears throat> if we just say identify that they are allowed to do what they think is best, 
we don't we don't dictate what it's going to be. We allow it to happen, but then we never know what it is, do we? And it doesn't come back to town hall and get registered anywhere. Your suggestion? Um, if they choose a hardscape feature. Well, I, I guess it would be approved at the way the conditions written is that that feature would be approved by the planning department through that building permit okay. process and maybe we could clarify that no, statement. I think it, that's um, fine I, I, yeah. I really I think, think it's important yeah, yeah I, I appreciate you highlighting those and we'll see if the applicant has any comments or questions <laughs> on them and I I would tend to agree with Ms. Auglis on the, the hardscape delineation that I I don't personally feel the need to be too prescriptive about that right now. Um, trust that staff can handle it if that's something that staff is willing to take on. At the discretion no. of the board. Right. <laughs> okay. So, Chair, I just had a quick question. So, as far as the hardscape, that would be something that you would review at the time that you issue a building permit for that particular building on that particular lot, right? I think that would be the way okay. it would be most clear. And mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So the yep. board wouldn't look at, have to look at it again. I shouldn't say you'd have to look at it again. You would look at it and make sure it was fine or, or the whoever issues the building permit. Right. So the way it's written right now, the conditions are written, is that our town engineer would review a site grading plan. And actually, we've, we've implemented, within the last year or so, every, every uh, uh, and I guess probably something I should have highlighted for the board a while ago, but um, every building permit application that comes in for a property that's in a subdivision actually now has a two-stage sign-off. It comes to my desk right now and hopefully the assistant planner soon as we get one <laughs> hired and, and on staff uh, to review sort of the, because I think Ms. Oglis was mentioning it earlier, our approvals, because all the good land <laughs> is gone, our approvals really are getting very nuanced. Every subdivision has its own little uniqueness to it. Right. And, uh, you know, I think Developers have done a good job of trying to, you know, adhere to what the ordinances are, and this board's done a good job of trying to find the balance. Um, and so what, what I do when I get it is I pull out the subdivision plan, the conditions, just be sure all the little notes and nuances are, are found. And then it goes to Angela's desk after I sign off, and she's looking at more of the, you know, uh, same type of stuff, but on the engineer side of things. Um, so we sign off before it even gets before our code officers who start looking at the nuts and bolts of the buildings. I mean, okay. they're, they're looking at plumbing fixtures right. and roof mm -hmm. rafters. So we're really looking at outside the walls. Right. Okay. Um, you need an assistant. <laughs> so we, we'll get one in soon enough. All right, thanks for clarifying that. Thanks. Did you have a we do. comment? We <laughs> do. This is new to us, so. Uh, I'll address it. Uh, good evening, Rocky Rispera. Uh, just, just for clarification, because um, I don't want to get into something we can't really make happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can understand the the, uh, the detail on the um, uh, grading plans for each lot. It's something I've always wanted to avoid, mm -hmm. but I understand that we're going there and, and we're going to have to deal with that. Um, I personally feel like qualified contractors can make decisions on site. And Any time you do an engineered plan, it handcuffs me. But I understand where the town's going, and uh, well, can, I can live with can that I, one. Can I speak to that? Because I think we went um, around with some other lots, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a full engineered grading plan. Um, and I've tried to work with some of those smaller contractors and on the napkin kind of thing and show me some flow lines and show me how it's going to generally be graded. I think in this case it's really about that's your limit of disturbance, mm -hmm. and I think it doesn't have to be some – big engineered plan doesn't so. have to have her stamp it does not need her stamp okay I'm, I'm good I have with my that. Own stamp. we can we, you know we go in with a plan in mind but you know we want to be able to have some okay. flexibility um, I do have a question about marking the um, the, the disturbed area and I, I need to get my head around that if I'm, if I'm understanding what you're talking about you know we've got a limit we can only disturb just so much area How, you want me to mark that around are you talking about sort of 5A? At I this guess point? it's 5A, yeah. Yeah, so, so this, the thinking here from staff is once you presumably build the house for your, your uh, uh, home buyer, either that home buyer or the next home buyer is going to be sitting on an acre and a half lot with, a, with only, you know, 10,000 square feet of lawn area. And they might say, well, geez, I should just cut some 
let's cut down some trees and create more lawn area out here. And that's something that's very difficult for the town to enforce and police because mm -hmm. we just, you know, our code officers drive around, but they won't, in a dead end road, they might not see it. Certainly at, you know, three, four, five, ten years down the road, this, again, this nuanced type approval is going to get lost in the shuffle and the not something that's likely to be picked up. Um, so this is really about, you know, as I said, I don't see it being more of a, a split rail fence along someone's backyard or a hedgerow that, that sort of says, all right, something's different here. Again, there, there is property owner responsibility, of course, and they should know, um, but I think uh, experience tells us that oftentimes folks purchase land and, and don't necessarily dive into the details too deep, and this is a, a further effort to sort of uh, limit um, potential for for issues. Well, I, I can understand why the town would be concerned about that. I mean, I, I do give all of my buyers a copy of the plan, whether people read them or not. I think likely they, they, they don't. Understood. I'm concerned about trying to mark that, though. I'm kind of thinking about these houses, and, and they're going to have trees. A lot of them are going to have trees all the way around them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have cleared the limit. Do I, do I mark all the way around that house with a fence? or? It, it could, you know, frankly, quite frankly, it could be just a little little uh, uh, triangle or, or diamond shaped uh, marker that gets tacked to a couple of trees along the way that says limit of clearing so it could be something that small and benign mm -hmm. um, okay this is new new ground I feel like yeah, we haven't really plowed this I mean we've done wetland setbacks and, yeah. and whatnot but uh, I'm just trying to get my head around what that would what that would look yeah. like so let's yeah, I, we'll figure it out okay all right Comment. I comment on that because it couldn't happen to with a nicer developer because <laughs> seriously <laughs> seriously Rocky takes this seriously and he's, he understands that this is new he heard heard us say it becomes more and more complicated all the time he knows it because that's what he's in the business of using these lot to the, the best advantage but not everybody's going to do that as carefully it's just not going to be done that way you can't predict it so coming up with a method that gets us where we want to go, and that's what we did here tonight. And I think it's a good work. It was good work. And putting a little thingy dingy on a tree or on a whatever, something basic and simple. Mm -hmm. But it, it's going to be needed more and more and more. So I appreciate your willingness to talk with us about it. And I think it's been very helpful for us to get some public time to discuss just how complex this all is nowadays. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. With that, With that, I will move to approve the project titled Heldenbrand Subdivision proposed by Risbera Properties LLC as depicted on plan set prepared by St. Clair Associates dated September 1st, 2017 with the following findings, waiver, and conditions. The applicant proposes a 10-lot residential subdivision with access off of Dresser Road. The residential subdivision is located within the Rural Residence and Farming District, RF, and has been designed in accordance with the Conservation Subdivision Design Standards as a conservation subdivision. Upon review of the application, I find that the subdivision meets requirements of the subdivision, subdivision ordinance and the town zoning ordinance. There is one waiver. Given the limited number of lots within the subdivision and the dead-end road design, the waiver request to reduce the roadway width from 24 feet to 22 feet is approved. Conditions. Number one, the subdivision sub shall be constructed in accordance with the subdivision plans titled Heldenbrand Subdivision prepared by St. Clair Associates dated September 1st, 2017. Prior to the release of the attested final subdivision plan to the applicant for recording at the Cumberland County Register of Deeds, the plan set shall be revised to address staff's comment related to wetland buffer delineation, add a table outlining the amount of impervious area and disturbed area allowed for each individual lot, provide notation on the plan view that the wetland crossing culvert is to be embedded, show the 10-foot dimension between the edge of pavement and the connection port to the fire tank, Further clarify the location of the 75-foot stream setback areas that are on lots 1 and 2 to ensure the areas are easily viewed and that the property owner's requirements for additional permitting within the areas are readily identifiable. Second condition, 
prior to the release of the attested final subdivision plan to the applicant for recording at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Number three, a, rec a recreation contribution in the amount of $250 shall be paid on a lot-by-lot -lot basis prior to the issuance of a building permit. Number four, prior to the start of site work, including any tree clearing, the limits of the 3.08 acres of disturbance and the 25-foot cemetery setback, setback are to be flagged. Number five, to ensure the limits of disturbance are not encroached upon, prior to the issuance of a building permit for each lot, a site-specific grading and drainage plan is to be submitted for review and approval by the town engineer. Prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the approved limits of disturbance are to be identified by a landscape or hardscape feature approved by the planning department. And the final condition, number six, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor. Pre-construction meeting is to be coordinated through the planning department. That's the motion. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor. That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good luck. <laughs> we have a staff report. Um, let's see. So I guess the only thing I'll mention tonight uh, is next week is the beginning of Plano Palooza. Um, <laughs> hopefully you all have seen the advertisements in the paper, the electronic newsletter, emails, and where else have we put it? Everywhere we can possibly posters around town. All sorts of good stuff. Uh, Plan of Palooza begins Monday evening, the 25th at 6.30 over at the high school. Um, get a presentation from our consultants, and we'll really start to roll up our sleeves and start working. Um, should mention that our consultant team that was selected for this project is going to, as I just said, be bringing a team of experts in a variety of fields from transportation, land use, land design, uh, climate resiliency, uh, housing, uh, economic development, uh, doing an ROI, return on investment type analysis based on land use types. Um, so it's going to be really exciting, pretty dynamic. It begins, like I said, Monday evening, all day Tuesday and all day Wednesday from, you know, at least 9 in the morning to 9 at night, and probably even later. Uh, basically, it's an open house come as you're able, between work, before work, after work, what have you. Um, it's going to be, the team will be above Scarborough Grounds at 264 U.S. Route 1, just across the street from Town Hall. As I said, they'll be there all day long, at least 12 hours, and I've heard they often stay quite a bit longer. Um, and so the intent there, again, is folks who, can, who can't make the evening events are, are, are welcome and encouraged to come, even if you can make those evening meetings. Um, then the open house, open studio time actually ends around noon on Thursday. And then Thursday evening, back at the high school, there is a closing ceremony, so to speak. It's the uh, consultants will be reflecting back what they've heard, um, really depicting a lot of drawings and illustrations about, you know, if the vision is Whatever we say the vision is, here's what that might look like. And be sure that um, they're, they're hearing the right things and it's our time to comment back. And, um, and so that's really our week-long process to get early public engagement. Um, and then I'll just note that after that process, there'll be about two, three, four months of plan writing. Things may seem like they go quiet and dormant, but there is a lot of work on the back end before the plan comes back to us as a draft. And I emphasize the word draft because ultimately it needs to be Scarborough's plan um, and so in late winter early spring we will start we'll renew to the renew the discussion that begins next week so um, all that remember plan of Palooza next week Monday we begin 630 at the high school and um, it goes on from there so uh, right. that is my staff report for now I guess I should also just Put a plug in for scarboroughengage.org. That's where you can find out more information and find the schedule. That's scarboroughengage.org. Thank you, Jay. Um, 
Is there an administrative amendment report? Do not have anything to report. All right. Any planning board correspondence? No. Any planning board comments? I will just say the fact that you gave it the name, gave it a name, Planapalooza, actually helps create excitement and gives you the opportunity, or gives me the opportunity to tell people about it. Because if you tell them there's a meeting at the high school at 6:30, nobody wants to go. But if you tell them it's a Planapalooza, it sounds like it's fun. <laughs> and, and so I, I should just note that Planapalooza is actually a trademark, a trademark. By, by our consultants. This consultant, this was one of the key sort of differential points of why they were chosen is that they, they have um, done this process in numerous communities across the country, but also here in Maine. Um, so it, it's sort of tried and true, and we, we are excited to see it. And yes, though people giggle every time they hear Plano Palooza, it sticks in the brain and think about it. So. Hey, what's that website again, Jay? Scarborough Engage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I definitely plan to stop by for at least some of that next week. Um, another comment I'll make, and I, I was reminded of this just before the meeting, our next planning board meeting was on a Tuesday due to the Columbus mm -hmm. Day holiday, so it'll be Tuesday, October 10th. Um, just uh, for anyone watching or others here who may not have I'll remembered that. Don't miss it. I, I will be in Nova Scotia uh, overdosing on Celtic music. All right. Thanks for that, Zoe. Hopefully, you'll make, hopefully you make it back. <laughs> I've done 13 concerts in eight days. Wow. I've tickets for. Excellent. Uh, any other comments? That I'll move to adjourn. Thank I'll you. second. All in favor? Thank you. <laughs>